Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda. And I'm Lindsay. And we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everybody. Today, we're talking about Tulpamancy. Ooh. A couple of weeks ago, <laughs> we released our Tulpa episode, which you don't have to listen to first to enjoy this episode, but it would probably be helpful. <laughs> Give a little bit more context to what we're talking about today. And if you've never heard of a Tulpa or are really unfamiliar with the concept, it might be useful to go listen to that episode first. Oh, yeah. Lindsay was a full-blown Tulpa scientist. Yeah. Yeah. It was wild. I was. And I am. <laughs> And I am, yes. And if I sound a little slurry, uh, I just had my four wisdom teeth removed a week ago, and uh, I'm still very puffy. And Amanda has been a trooper with her four wisdom teeth coming out because it wasn't an easy time for her. It was not. It wasn't an easy wisdom tooth removal as they can be, you know? Right. Well, Amanda, you sound lovely as always. I feel like maybe at the beginning of every episode, I'm just going to say that I have an old dog and she makes old dog sounds, but I'm not going to kick her out. So Moo's going to be snoring. I'm going to be slurring. It's going to be a good episode, guys. But tulpas. Anyway, today, tulpas. So as I said a second ago, you don't have to listen to the first tulpa episode in order to enjoy this one, but there is more background on it. Before we get into Talpa Mancy, we're going to talk about our working definition of what a Talpa is. It's from Natasha Michael and Joseph Laycock. And that definition is, a Talpa is an entity that can be created by anyone, usually inadvertently, exists independently of its creators, is sentient and capable of rebellion, and is frightening, if not dangerous. And that is Terrifying. so different from what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, today is wild. Today is like a while, but I also am just like so incredibly fascinated by this because I'm a big believer in whatever you think the world is, it is. If you think everything's shit and terrible, it's going to be that. If you think things are good, then you might see good things. Not that like positive thinking can like undo bad circumstances, but if you don't purposefully notice good stuff, sometimes it's hard to notice good stuff. Yes. But today we're going to be talking about the practice of tulpamancy, which as I just said, is a deviation from that definition. And then we're going to talk about all the things that could be a tulpa that we've already talked about. And that list is so long. It also was a fun exercise in like, what have we talked about? <laughs> Sometimes I go back to some of our older episodes and I was like, oh, we did talk about that. And I'll listen. And I'll be like, I don't remember talking about this, but I did two, three years ago. Yeah. It's it's just <laughs> wild. It's so wild. Ooh, can I maybe say a small hint here for our April thing? Yeah, I was going to lead into that because yeah. talking about older episodes. Yes, I listened to one recently as I was making hints for our Patreon as to what will be happening in April. So there's another hint Ooh, in itself. Yeah. And as I was listening to the episode, I was putting pieces of that hint picture together. Yes. Which is funny because that's not what the original purpose of the trip was it was an add-on later all. yeah exactly exactly and as you were saying that i was like you said we were going to re-listen to that together on the ride to the place not that one so yeah, now one. you've listened to it but you haven't i'm glad that we're going to re-listen to that other episode together and be really judgmental of ourselves i'm like i'm hoping that i'm going to be like no we were new and like able to be that person but i know that i'm gonna be like oh no <laughs> oh, no. So there's another hint. Yeah, there's multiple places, mm -hmm, multiple mm -hmm. episodes, lots of things happening. Very excited. Yeah, I'm so excited. It's all we talk about daily. And I'm stoked. Yeah, yeah. So back to Tulpamancy. Tulpas were typically only discussed in occult circumstances until 2009, when several discussion boards on 4chan began discussing Tulpas. Members of the discussion boards began creating Tulpas. Now... <laughs> It's hard for me to say this with a straight face. <laughs> so, okay. Can she do it? Also, before we, I'm sorry, before we started researching, Amanda was like, it hurts to smile. And I was like, Ugh. yeah, yeah, oh, uh oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, if I could say this with a straight face, after these discussion boards began, right? Then a group of people got a hold of Tulpas and they were the bronies. 
never in a thousand years did I think that when our Tulpa research began, would it end with bronies. I never thought that I'd say the word bronies on our podcast. It's just really not where I thought we were going. Honestly, I I only dreamed. (laughs) So uh, bronies, if you didn't know, they are adult fans of My Little Ponies. I think the gals are different have a different name woman bronies i literally was just saw this on an episode of storage wars where they talked about it pegasus sisters are the girls it says <laughs> yeah but i think that bronies has become like a gender neutral term because like pegasus sisters that's a lot honestly sounds like something very different it really does yeah so um bronies they got a hold of tulpas and now on their reddit forum it has over six thousand members So Bronies picked it up. It continued to grow. So then Tulpas became more well-known in manga and fantasy fans began to also make Tulpas as well. So the group of people talking and knowing about Tulpas just continued to increase. Yeah. And I think that's generally kind of an interesting facet of this, that it went from like occult spaces, which is, you know, like dabbling in like i don't know when i think occult i think of like the magical which inherently to me becomes fantasy because like i feel like a lot of fantasy writing has magic in it so i think it's interesting that it kind of went full circle back to it yeah yeah and in this internet realm it's abundantly clear that some of these tulpas are not distinct beings rather that they are a separate consciousness within the host As a being that lives in one's mind, people report that their tulpa could help them unlock repressed memories, heal traumas, or control subconscious functions, like yawning. So that's why. That is so (laughs) fucking wild to me. Yeah. That's amazing. Whether you believe in this or not, the ability to do those things and being able to have some control of it, you know, like, especially if you're talking about like trauma work. I would imagine that would be very empowering if I was a person who had deemed myself a tulpa mancer. All I'm thinking of is like a tulpa therapist. Oh, no. Like sitting inside your mind, right? Like healing traumas. So like, yes, but as we get into this and we're going to talk about this more is that while tulpas often like serve a function, this particular flavor of tulpa while they may serve a function that is inherently beneficial to the Tulpamancer, they're still thought to be like in a three-dimensional character. It seemed to me that the idea was like to create this entity that is like a friend, if you will. And like you wouldn't treat your friend as like a single thing, like just a therapist or just for sex or like just to be your cheerleader, right? Like friends should be give and take and it should be more than just like, what can that person give to you? And so that's how I imagined it. But I mean, I could be wrong. I'm no topomancer, but I think that that's really interesting. Well, I was thinking like, that's kind of what a friend can do for you though, right? Like if you sit and chat for a long time, they can help you figure out things or like figure out your shit or... Oh, yeah. They they don't help you with yawning, unfortunately, but they do a lot for you. I mean, they can if they yawn, because then you'll yawn if (laughs) if that's a thing that you're inclined to do. Yeah. So accordingly, when we talk about the practice of tulpamancy, it's distinct from other types of tulpa creation because these tulpas do not manifest in a unique form in the physical world. Remember, we're talking about in one's mind. So the process by which tulpas are created in tulpamancy differ from what we're going to call traditional tulpa creation as well. The creation of tulpas in tulpamancy begins in a place called Wonderland. Why not? I mean, it makes sense, right? Wonderland, tulpas, sure. Yeah. This is a space that is imagined by the tulpamancer through visualization. The first place the tulpa will exist is in Wonderland, and it's where the tulpa will live most of the time. So... There's a special process. There's a special place. So, of course, there are also special terms. Lots of special things. That we use in other instances, but there's unique usage for tulpamancy. So let's get into our glossary of tulpa terms, if you will. Uh, And don't worry, once we're done with our glossary, I have a beautiful example that I've written. I'm so excited to read (laughs) it to you. As we talk about terms, we're also going to like pepper in how tulpas are created because it kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah. So forcing is the act of creation that brings a tulpa into existence. During this, the tulpamancer will visualize every detail of the tulpa. So how they look, how they move, how they speak, the cadence in which they speak, how they'll sound, how they'll smell, everything. And so that's what forcing is. So it's basically like 
if you're thinking of character creation, right? Yeah. That's what forcing is. But it's more than just thinking, oh, they'll have red hair. It's They'll think about their red hair and like the way that it looks and how thick or thin it is and the texture of it and the way that it smells and the way that it moves in the wind. And, like every little detail to like really form a like, full picture in their head. So then there's also narration. And this is the practice of the tulpomancer verbally speaking out loud on behalf of the tulpa. Interesting. This typically occurs in the creation process before the tulpa is fully formed and self-evident. So it's kind of like if you were creating a character and you were saying like, and then they're going to sound like this, right? Like you're talking in that way. Yeah. I think to create or to, to be able to imagine in this level of detail and intensity, I actually find incredibly impressive. And whenever I talk about writers, I talk about world builders because that's what I think writers are. And I find that just like to be one of the coolest things that a person can do. And so I think that this is in that same way of like world building that you're creating like full entity because whether or not you believe that this is a thing that is actually happening and that these people are experiencing to be able to like imagine to that degree, I just find very impressive. Right. To compose something so different. Yes. And so it takes intense focus and mental energy to engage in both forcing and narration. And it can also be time intensive to create a tulpa. But from what we've looked at, it seems like a very big no-no to start like gauging how much time you're spending. There isn't like a, oh, it should take you 10 hours. Or if it takes you less than five, then it's not real. It doesn't seem like that is a benchmark. It's the completeness of the visualization. So different people might do that at different speeds. So there's not like a, oh, it has to be this long in order for it to be complete. So I think th this is one of the most fascinating parts of this. And you'll be able to tell later when I like intensely nerd out about science that I have really done my best to understand. <laughs> um, so, OK, during the process of forcing, a person is presumably sitting in a place that they're comfortable, right? They're in their own home or someplace where they can really focus and do this thing. So during this, the topomancer may experience a physical sensation that doesn't have an external source. Most topomancy experts will say that these sensations are from the tulpa. So if you think like, say you felt a scratch on your arm that was like the claws of the tulpa touching you, or say you felt like something warm press up against your leg, but there's nothing there tulpa creepy and people will see this as like proof of the tulpa interacting with them and like proof of its existence right yeah so once the tulpa mancer has fully formed the tulpa the tulpa mancer can choose to let that tulpa take control of their body which sounds wild because again remember they are not existing typically outside of the body yeah. of the tulpa mancer they're typically just in a person's head right right so yeah remember that in their head not in the physical world so when she's talking about taking over the Tulpamancer's body, they're doing this with the Tulpamancer's permission. So even though they're giving permission in the Tulpa realm, it's called possession. And that's when the Tulpa takes control of the Tulpamancer's body. And this is typically done incrementally. So first, the basic body movements, then more difficult body movements, and then they'll learn to speak. And it seems kind of like how like a baby would develop, right? But just in a super quick fashion instead of taking years and years. And then when the tulpa either takes control of the tulpa monster's body or, you know, gives control back, that's called switching. So possession and switching, very similar. Switching can happen at the will of either the tulpa or the tulpa monster. And when tulpas are controlling the host's body, the person is able to retake control at any time. So they can be like, I want this back. So it's very different from what we typically think of as possession, right? Because normally that's when you're like, you don't want to be possessed and you can't get them out of your body. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that how much kind of like vernacular there is around this that like, it's like, okay, it's called possession when the tulpa is in control of the tulpa mancer's body and then they switch and that's when the tulpa mancer's back. Or even if the tulpa mancer's in control and the tulpa is going to take possession, they do that through switching, which I'm like, yeah, that's just the word that that, that is, you know? But like <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. the glossary is like switching and like explains. And I was like, okay, that's just the word switching and what it means. Right? Like, that's what I would name it too. Thank yeah. You. At least it's not some crazy word that is hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> so tulpa mancers can also seek to impose their tulpas. And this means that they will actually see them in the physical world and be able to interact with them in the physical world, but others are unable to see them. It's akin to an auditory, visual, olfactory, tactical hallucination, which kind of freaks me out. It's interesting because it's also purposeful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And so this is different too, because my first thought when I read this was, you know, what if someone's in a really bad headspace and they create something horrible, right? And they like unleash it onto the world. It's not the same thing as like, say, Slenderman that we talked about before, right? Yes, because remember a little bit ago, we talked about there's topomancy and then what we're calling like traditional topo creation. And in traditional topo creation, it's often an unintentional. So it's more like so many people are thinking and visualizing this creature and believing it that it actually manifests in our physical world. And that's what Slender Man would be. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, he started out as like part of an internet contest and then he became, he went more in creepypastas. People wrote short stories about him. People made videos about him. People, there began to be sightings about him, right? Mm -hmm. And so this whole lore and like rich <laughs> tapestry of, of Slender Man existence was created. And that took hundreds and thousands of people to do, right? So at some point, is it like we all believed so much that he actually was created versus in Tulpamancy, it's one person intensely visualizing a entity that will exist only to them unless the Tulpa is in possession of their body and interacting with another person. But even still, it's their form communicating with other people and the Tulpa just might be in control. Mm -hmm. I say this as though, do I believe? I don't know. But like, assuming that this is all real, that's what the difference would be. One of the things that I just, I really found so lovely about Topomancy was that often people who were in a dark place and were not happy or not doing well mentally, the Topas they created were hopeful. Yeah. They weren't kind. things that were going to hurt themselves further. Mm -hmm. They were like something that was going to help them and unlift them. A few minutes ago, Amanda talked about like healing trauma and stuff like that. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But yeah, they're told the therapist. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that like they tend to have a positive impact on the top of answer. Mm -hmm. Even if like you're like, oh, my gosh, this is a hallucination. OK, but like it's helping. Is it bad? Yeah. And, and everything that we define by Western medicine doesn't mean it's correct. Exactly. It's just maybe we don't know yet. We had hysteria at one point. Mm -hmm. We also uh, thought that whale carcasses could uh, be helpful to your body. Yeah. Yeah. Just dipping dip your body Ugh. in the mist. Gross. You know what it also makes me think of, though, is imaginary friends, too. Like when people really mm -hmm. need an imaginary friend and then they create one mm -hmm. to help them like work through something. And then again, I'm thinking of I, I know I said it last episode, but like a lot of the movies, right? The imaginary friend or whatever is with them until they don't need them anymore. Yeah. And that's what it kind of makes me think of. Yeah. Sorry, my headphones are making sounds because I'm only wearing it on half my head because it's like you know, swollen. I hate this. <laughs> so sorry if you hear weird sounds. So back to our terms, though. There's one more term, and that's deviation. And that's what a tulpa changes in a way that the tulpamancer did not will. So this is typically like a pleasant surprise. Like something the Tulpamancer didn't even know that they wanted, but they were given. Okay, so we've got all of our language, right? We've got forcing, narration, possession, switching, deviation. Let's put it all together. I wrote just a little story about Amanda. Oh, gosh. And on our outline, it just said, insert decret dialogue. So like, I have no <laughs> idea what she's going to say. Oh, yeah. Not or secret, what a decret. 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 Yeah. yeah, insert decret dialogue. <laughs> sometimes our outlines are really just a test of whether Amanda can think on her feet because I'm pu <laughs> I have sometimes the most unhinged uh, typos in here because I'm like ch ch going so fast. But this time, insert decret dialogue. Okay. Yes. Yes. It's time for the decret. <laughs> Ahem. We're going to see if I can get through all of this without laughing. I am optimistic. I have to not look. I'm actually going to minimize her. So I can't see her. Is there going to be um, a fun accent for this? Oh, yeah. But I can't do the accent, so it's even better. Okay, good. Good. As she forced her talpa, meringue, Amanda said, I don't know why I picked this one. I can't do a Boston accent. <laughs> Gee willikas, in a heavy Boston accent. This was the personality and dialect of the talpa she was visualizing's first thought. As Amanda focused on the lush, long fur that encased meringue's square body, that looked much like a pillow, and the narrow legs that propelled it as it ran across Wonderland, she could smell the distinct and comforting smell of chocolate chip cookies baking in the oven. 
Amanda had been forcing meringue for hours, and there was no one else home, so she knew that there were no cookies baking in the kitchen. There was no ordinary explanation for why she could smell them. She knew that this had to be the unique scent of meringue. (laughs) The creature's disposition, much like the cookies they smelled like, was sweet and warm. Once meringue was formed, Amanda had no issues switching with her to let her possess her so that she could eat the cookies. Sometimes, when Amanda would sit and watch TikToks of Neil the Seal, she could feel the weight of meringue pressed up against her leg as she slept peacefully beside her. Meringue's presence was so realistic to Amanda that she could hear meringue purring softly and can run her fingers through meringue's long black fur. As Amanda sat with meringue, she realized that meringue's purr was a deviation. While Amanda had never imagined meringue's purr, she did find it soothing and was so happy to hear it. And those are all of her terms. (laughs) All I was thinking during it is like, oh, I just imagined a cookie dog and then it turned into a cat. And I was like, oh, man, I'm sorry. That's what you're imagining. You don't know who meringue is. It's clearly it's the the square pillow that we don't the unknown. But also it now it's a dog and then it turned into a cat that brings cookies. Okay. Meringue is very clearly the square pillow cryptid <laughs> from Vans Hardware from our <laughs> Georgia Guidestones episode. So just really take meringue in. Why did I name her that? I don't know. But I thought it was, I was great. like who let meringue loose into Vans Hardware's area? I don't know. Would it be Vans Hardware Tulpa first? And then I hear me out. Hear me out. Stole it. (laughs) So this is the episode. We get famous. People hear this. They begin to know about meringue. People begin to believe in meringue. People begin to think about meringue. Meringue is created through traditional Tulpa creation. She then goes through a time rift. Okay. Okay. And runs in front of his car. Okay. That's how it happened. So it's just hmm. cyclical, a real chicken and the egg situation. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. I mean, I've always really wanted a black square, long haired cookie cat. Who does? Yeah. Who doesn't want that? <laughs> I love it. I love meringue. <laughs> Perfect. Good. You should. I'm glad. <laughs> so when you're reading about Topomancy, it's incredibly difficult to parse out people who were writing about their actual experience or people who are writing fictionalized accounts of a topomancer's experience. And inevitably, there's going to be people who put funky things into places just to be a dick, right? Yeah. And so it's it's kind of hard to go between the two. But one of the things that, I again, I really find fascinating and interesting about topomancy is its kind of connection with mental health. The practice of topomancy as a whole, forcing and interacting with one's topo overlaps with several Western mental health diagnoses like schizophrenia, frontal lobe epilepsy. These would both account for the visual hallucinations or the feeling as though another person is in one's head. Mm -hmm. The other is uh, hiatoscopy. And that it overlaps with topomancy in the idea of imposition. Because again, remember, imposition has the topo existing in the physical world for the topomancer alone. Individuals who experience hiatoscopy experience a double of themselves but at a distance. So don't think like you look at your hand and you see double, like you see two of your hand. Think like you're seeing a distinct fucking person. Hmm. So one example that we saw of this was a person who was walking in the dark in their home to get a glass of water and it was in the middle of the night. And they're walking and they see this double of themselves and it's so clear that they think they have walked by a mirror, but they hadn't. And in the other version of themselves, they were holding a lamp. So it was a full on different fucking like it wasn't them holding the glass of water like they were. It had a lamp. And I am so fascinated by this. I want to do a different episode on it and dig more into it because I find that just fascinating. The idea that like that type of experience we're like, we have a medical diagnosis for I'm like, get fucked. That's another dimension. (laughs) And it's a really hard. It's going to be really hard to convince me otherwise. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So additionally, dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder, is when an individual person has two or more distinct personalities living within one person. And we've talked about this in some of our other episodes as well. So some people refer to tulpamancy as tulpa therapy because it could be used to treat DID or schizophrenia in ways that do not require a person to be institutionalized. One user A person named Sam from Maryland said that their tulpa stopped their hand from harming themselves with a knife and would fight their anxiety, which I kind of love. That's awesome. Right? 
Dr. Samuel Vessier conducted an online study which included 166 tulpamancers that were spread throughout the U.S. and Western Europe. The majority of those studied were shy men, and their ages ranged from 17 to 34 years old. The tulpas that respondents reported were similar to imaginary friends. They offered companionship, and there was a subsect of the tulpamancers who were bronies, and their tulpas were anthropomorphic ponies. I do love it. I just do. I do. I think it's <laughs> whimsical. It is, yeah. Of the respondents who self-reported mental diagnosis from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as the DSM, 93.7% of them said that tulpamancy improved their condition. Per Vissier, forming positive relationships with the symptoms of schizophrenia or DID can assist in recovery. I would also imagine that integral to this healing is also having a community of people who are not stigmatizing your mental health diagnosis mm -hmm. and also like being supportive of you and taking the stigma away a little bit. And I do think it's lovely, amazing, glorious, gorgeous to see people being able to make positive impacts in their own life in a way that feels concrete to them in whatever yeah. way that may be. Yeah. Because so often when you hear about people with schizophrenia or DID, people assume that they are unable to have independence and just really neat to me. Yeah. This one's really neat too. So there's one person named Logan and he recounted that turning his schizophrenic manifestations into tulpas gave him the ability to face them and sort them in a way that made sense to him. So that's really neat that he was able to like work through things using tulpas. Yeah. So part of the study was Vissier communicated via email or questionnaire with the tulpas. Love it. So he's he's talking to the tulpas through their people, right? Most of the tulpas reported that their baseline effect was different from the tulpamancer. Additionally, tulpas did not experience the tulpamancer's health conditions. I think it's really important to note just here before we continue on that nearly every culture has some sense of the supernatural existing in people's lives. Mm -hmm. And there is only so much that I think that science and medicine as we have them today can explain the world. I do think that there are things that go beyond our understanding and that I think that one of the reasons that we have some types of diagnoses in the world is because we do not have words for supernatural in some instances, right? I think that's fair, yeah. Yeah, and so do I know that tulpamancy is real? I don't know, but I don't know everyone and everything. So who am I to say what can and cannot happen? Yeah, I said it before. Our mind is very powerful and we don't know what it's capable of, right? We don't know everything. Yeah. Just as much as we don't know the ocean. <laughs> yeah, we don't know the ocean. <laughs> one of my favorite books that I've ever read is The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And one of the things that she talks about in it is, I believe she calls it the censor. It's the voice in your head that tells you you can't do it. It says like, ooh, what if everybody thinks that you look dumb? What if you look bad? What if they're thinking this about you? I have that in my head, right? Like that exists in my head. And I don't think that that's me. Like when I think of like who I am as a person, I don't think of myself as that negative talk. So what the fuck is that? What is that nasty voice that's mean to me sometimes in my head? And I, I know many people who have that. So what is that? I don't know. Who's to say that I couldn't reprogram that thing to be nice to me? Maybe that's what these people have done. Maybe. And they just like through the power of like visualization – were able to create that reality for themselves in their head and that they were simply not going to hear a negative version of that, a negative version of self-talk. I don't know. The mind's a fucking wild place. It is. But okay. Wait, I also, on top of that, which I love, like changing the way you think using a tulpa, right? Mm -hmm. But also, I don't know why this came. Well, I do know. It's because we said the ocean. If we all... Oh my God. Just Jesus consider fucking Christ. Oh thinking my about God. The Basilosaurus. And getting some strong bones. With some strong Maybe you bones. Can will, you can will him into having strong yes. bones. Yes. And then Ooh, think so, about it. In a few years, they're going to discover him and he's actually going to be deeper in the ocean because his bones could tolerate it. Okay. That's what's going to happen. I'm just going to put this out there. Integral to who a Basilosaurus is, <laughs> is their, their lemoniness. So maybe they'll be yellow. It's not a basilosaurus then. 
It's simply not. It could not. be. It's its cousin. Yeah, but then it wouldn't be a basilosaurus. It would be something else. Okay, well, it's a basilosaurus that has strong bones and is yellow now. I don't know what the okay. problem is. Also, I'm sorry. The basilosaurus on our sticker last year. What color is that, Lindsay? He's yellow and okay, he has dull thank teeth. You. Okay, thank you. He has dull teeth because he's bad at eating. <laughs> He's not bad at anything, okay? He's flawless. Okay, but real quick, Amanda, close your eyes. I want you to imagine. I'm gonna. We're. I'm fucking making him right now. This is the episode where we get famous. So clearly, (laughs) this is gonna work. Okay, (laughs) I want you to imagine Mm -hmm. a long creature. It's about the size of a school bus. Okay. And while it's yellow, it's not school bus yellow. It's um like a pale yellow. Like an Easter dress yellow, like a pale yellow. Okay. I know it's not the best description, but you're you're following me here, right? A pastel yellow, not quite a banana, lighter than that. Like a banana pudding, a banana pudding yellow. Okay. Okay. So, so far we are at a creature that is the size of a school bus, but is banana pudding yellow. Yep. Yeah. And we need everyone to be doing this because we need it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Are, are you closing your eyes person? I mean, don't, if you're driving, don't do that. But Otherwise, <laughs> all of your attention. Don't you dare multitask while we're creating an Amandasaurus. Um, this is her creature. Uh, it has appropriately strong bones for a creature that is deep in the ocean. Finally. Finally. It has the jaw strength to just honestly just chomp right the fuck through a b- Basilosaurus in one single bite. And what else? Could and you- the Georgia Guidestones, if they still existed. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So... <laughs> powerful jaws with appropriately sharp teeth it is sleek like a dolphin so like imagine like that slippery consistency Uh it inexplicably does smell like banana pudding though that's why it's that color um yeah, yeah it has no eyes because it exists deep in the ocean and does not need them okay okay but it does hear exceptionally well yes it has a long thick tail kind of like a whale and its fins are long on the side, kind of like a basilosaurus. So it looks similar to a basilosaurus, it just better in every way. Well, also, I think it can have eyes. It just doesn't use them, but it's going to have like luscious lashes. Okay. But I think that that's going to deter how it's swimming. Amanda, I'm trying to get this to be real and exist. No, it well, it, I mean, some of them have like what if, you, eye holes. You want to create it and then it just die? immediately sink up to the surface no it's not gonna die it's just gonna look really cute okay it's got eyes i'm sorry yeah it just doesn't use them we'll go back okay we're starting over it is but leave everything they still need to know all this, this is important details okay I okay mean, it can have some have eyes depending on the depth some are a little higher than others some Amanda, are lower. do you know how creatures work they all have to have some common fucking things for them to be the same thing um there's a lot of people with only one eye or no eyes okay and they're fine you are completely right that people are sometimes born with different amounts of eyes, but standard for humans is two eyes, as far as I am aware. The basilosaurus doesn't fit in the mold, okay, Lindsay? But we're not making a basilosaurus because we can't make a basilosaurus because it wouldn't be a basilosaurus Just wait. Just wait. if it didn't have brittle fucking bones. All of my free time is going to be making a tulpa of a basilosaurus and they're going to find it in the ocean, Lindsay. It's not going to be a basilosaurus, though. Okay, okay, hear me out, hear me out. Okay, we have a long, sleek creature that has a whale-like tail, but long flippers on the outside, on the on, on its sides. It's banana pudding yellow. It also smells like banana pudding. It has eyes. They're simply ornamental because it's so dark and in, in the deep sea, it doesn't need to see it. But it does have lashes. Yes. Slippery looking like a dolphin, very smooth. It looks like it's smiling, but not in a scary way, in like a good way. The jaw strength to chomp straight through an old basilosaurus. It is somehow inexplicably because it's magic, right? It's simply fucking magic. The eyelashes under the water, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's not your business. Okay. It has a necklace that says, I am the real basilosaurus on it. It's very large. Okay. So a necklace is fine. Okay. Keep going. Yeah. Well, this way people know it's a real basil. Though it's the real basilosaurus, and we've simply said it. We we've accounted for the magic, right? That's why it also smells like banana pudding, and it's deep in the sea. Okay. Okay. That's the traditional creation of tulpas. But anyway, do we know if tulpas exist? Do we know if tulpamancy is quote unquote real? 
I don't know. That's not for me to decide. But in our research, we did come across some theories as to what people think tulpas may be. One of the things we read was an article by Dr. Arthur Giuliani, and it was called On Tulpas. And he has two possible theories as to how tulpomancers are experiencing tulpas. Okay. The first is called noise recruitment theory. Stick with me, okay? Okay. This is a tough one. It took me several times to read and understand. I'm going to try to explain it in a way that is not boring, but is also accurate. We're trying our best. So, okay. An individual's conscious experience is created through a balance of signals and noise in neural activity within your own nervous system, right? Right. So, for example, an individual without a visual impairment will see something because there is one, a sensory signal that's being produced by light that enters the individual's eye, and two, those signals of the light are being sent to the brain and received by the brain. So you've got the sensory signal coming in and a signal going to the brain. As a result, a person can see because those two things are working together. So you can think of this as light signal plus signal to the brain equals vision of light, right? Right. So when a person is hallucinating, on the other hand, that's what's called top-down processing of signals. So in our example of the light, think a person is seeing light, although there is no light signal that's coming in. So there is a signal going to the brain that there's light, but there's no sensory input that's coming in. So there's no reason for it. And so if you think about it, it's kind of like the conclusion exists before the two signals. Yeah. So I call it the conclusion. It's called endogenous neural activity, which is when your sensory signal and signal to the brain, you're missing one of these. So typically individuals who are not predisposed to hallucinations experience very little endogenous neural activity. And that's because there's an incompatibility with the incoming sensory experience because it's a result of a random activity within the individual's nervous system. So their brain's basically like, this is just noise in the system. Yeah. So when you feel like you're seeing light, when you get the brain signal of there's light, but there's no light coming in, your body treats it just like noise. So unless you are a person who hallucinates, you're not going to assign meaning to that. You're going to assume like, oh, that endogenous neural activity, a.k.a. the conclusion of there is light, Uh isn't just isn't going to register. Dr. Giuliani theorizes that, quote, creating a tulpa involves assigning meaning through association of this noise with a cognitive construct of the tulpa. So, for example, earlier we talked about Amanda's sensory experiences without external stimuli. In Amanda's story, it was her smelling her tulpa's unique scent, chocolate chip cookies. Mm -hmm. So, there's no chocolate chip cookies present. She knows that there is no chocolate chip cookies present, and yet she smells it. This should be noise in the system because there's no olfactory sensory data coming in. It's simply the signal to the brain. But because there's a reason for the noise, meringue, then it doesn't seem as random. It doesn't seem like noise because you have a reason for that to happen. Similarly, if you felt the sun on your arm, you felt the warmth of the sun, you knew you walked outside, but you had a blindfold on that was completely light blocking, you would probably know that it was light out, right? You'd be able to tell that you were under the sun because there's other things going on. And so I find that so fascinating, right? Dr. Giuliani points out that when this is done hundreds or even thousands of times, that endogenous neural activity will signify the existence of the tulpa. So, right, we had Amanda's chocolate chip cookie example. But imagine that you had thousands of experiences like that. It would absolutely feel as though your tulpa was real, right? Imagine you could feel that pressure against your leg. You would think that that's what it is. Some people talk about like when they hear random noise in the distance, They'll hear like some people make it. It sounds more like voices to them. And some people it just sounds like nothing. But say, you know, that random noise, you were like, oh, that random noise is from my tulpa. It makes that sound. So then this sound that you like aren't sure if you're actually hearing or not Mm -hmm. is your tulpa or the sensation of something pressing against you, the coldness in the room. Anything is proof of that tulpa to you. And so you assign meaning to this what is generally and otherwise would have been noise in the system. Oh, interesting. (laughs) Yes. Dr. Giuliani also has dual hemisphere theory that he suggests. And that is basically the thought that one could purposely dissociate their left hemisphere from their right hemisphere in their brain and that separate consciousnesses could form in each one. And so that one is the topomancer, the other is the topa. Both interesting, but some people have several topas. That's a lot. (laughs) Yeah. Like, I don't know if topomancy is real 
or not real, but it really doesn't seem like it's hurting anybody. Now, there are people who do have sex with their tulpas. We're not going to get into that because I really feel like that's like some of the most salacious stuff to talk about with this. And I think that that's where a lot of topomancy conversations end up. And it ends up in this mocking place where people are being disrespectful to this community. And whether or not I agree with everything in there, that's just not for me to judge, you know. But yeah. people can feel physical sensation with them. And so some people have their topas for years. Some people have them for short periods of time. But it seems like a, an overall relatively OK thing. Yeah. To like, yeah. why am I going to yuck your yum? You think you've got like a 10 inch pony hanging out in your fucking head that loves you and wants to do sexual things to you? Great. Go live your life. Good for you. Yeah. All right. Well, Lizzie said at the beginning, but we're going to talk about what else could be told us from a lot of our episodes from before. And also just a, as a little asterisk to that, we're back to traditional tulpa creation. So as a reminder from the beginning... Our definition for that is a tulpa is an entity that can be created by anyone, usually inadvertently, exists independently of its creators, is sentient and capable of rebellion, and is frightening, if not dangerous. So drastically different from tulpamancy, but still in the same realm, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what could be tulpas then? So Black Forest, think about it. All the things that they were experiencing could be done by a tulpa, mm -hmm. including the apparitions they were seeing the mm -hmm. smells mm -hmm. the the cold spots and such the lights even um i remember the mirror that's where the vo yes. vortex bouncer was born yes the vortex bouncer could be a tulpa mm -hmm. zozo which we talked about in our 11th episode i think we called it urban legends but it was like creature kind of episodes because we talked about yetis too and black-eyed children also, Bloody Mary, which has been around for a very long time, right? Yeah, I think that that's like a really classic tulpa in the same way that people think Slender Man is a tulpa, because how many people believe in Bloody Mary uh -huh. and have this vision of what she looks like? Yeah. So we've already said this, I think, in our last tulpa episode, but ghosts in general. All of them. So think of like our ghost, any ghost episode we've had, ghosts, more ghosts, a lot of the haunting episodes. So like Hotel Del Coronado. Now it's said that the Velisca Axe Murder House is haunted. Would you ever want to visit like a place that's like that old and haunted? I think so. I think it would be an interesting experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be too. But yeah, any of our haunting episodes. So think of like Plucky England, the Elms Hotel, which is another one on my list, right? I really want to go there. Yeah. Um, a lot of the places in Galveston, Malvern Manor, you know, we the put them on the map. Malvern Manor. <laughs> But, I mean, the ghosts there, right? Hawthorne Hotel, Cecil Hotel, which is now Stay on Main in LA. I think I'm actually going to stop in there, I'm hoping, in June. Oh, nice. Um, the Hotel San Carlos in Arizona and Hoya Bashu, which was a haunted forest. And then think of all the weird occurrences of the other episodes we've talked about. So like Bridgewater Triangle, the Island of Dolls, the Bermuda Triangle. So a lot of these could be due to a tulpa or like group tulpas, right? We're all thinking of the same thing. And when we go to some of these places, we experience a lot of the same things that others have. Yeah. And Amanda, she already mentioned one urban legend, but it occurs to me now that also the bunny man would also be another example of, of someone who could exist that was a tulpa. Because in that episode, we talked about that there was no crime that happened that would explain that particular legend really there's like some awful things that happened but nothing that was like directly correlated and so people seeing a similar boogeyman that doesn't have any historical root that sounds like a tulpa to me it really so does. and i mean you know i'm excited to say this all the fucking cryptids <laughs> every single fucking one of them but because i will never ever pass up a opportunity to give our list of what we've covered so far in terms of cryptids, that could be the Loveland Frogman, the Chula Chucky, the Jersey Devil, the Ninjin, the Goatman of Poplick Creek, Sheep Squatch, the Ozark Howler, our favorite bean-shaped cryptid, the Dover Demon, the Snallygaster, the Mini Washitu, the Walking Man of South Dakota, Dwayo, the Muggion Monster, the Dogman of, I believe this one we talked about was in Michigan, but dogmen generally, uh, Chupacabra, 
Mothman, the Flatwoods Monster, the Beast of Bladenboro, aka Bob. Bob. I didn't include the Hopkinsville Goblins, also known as like the Little Green Men, because other people didn't see them. It was just that one time. At the Hopkinsville, but the other Green Men that kind of turned into a sensation, yeah. perhaps. Different, different. But the Hopkinsville Goblins, those were like seen once, so I didn't include them in our list. But also, this is my favorite one. All the Christmas monsters. <laughs> Birch on a perch. Krampus, Krampus could be a tulpa. Ooh, he could. He could. Birch on a perch could be a tulpa. <laughs> so many fucking things. I, I mean, like, I really do love the idea that, like, anything supernatural, if we believe hard enough, Tinkerbell style, we can get it. Wait, wait. So, by that sense, Uh-oh. the Blair Witch. I feel like, look, man. She's there. She's there. I can't wait yeah. to go because we're going to go find her. Here's the thing, though, right? The idea of a spooky lady in the woods who's creepy, sure, love that. But an idea of somebody who's killing people, I don't want to create murderous She tulpas. doesn't kill people anymore. She was pissed back then. She got a pet. She started traveling. She worked on herself. Okay. She's in therapy. Yes. It's, she's fine now. She's She's great. You just have to be nice to her and believe in her so that when okay. you go to Burkittsville, Maryland... <laughs> You can find her. <laughs> I have loved that some of our patrons have been sending pictures of like when they pass Burkittsville and it makes me so upset because yeah. I just, I'd be like, I don't care what, what we're doing today. We have to go to Burkittsville. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the end of this discussion of Tulpas. I have no doubt in my mind that this will enter almost everything in the future of like, well, it could be a Tulpa because again, <laughs> everything could be a Tulpa. That's going to be the explanation now. Yeah. It's just a Tulpa. It's a yeah. Tulpa. Yeah. Well, we already started the episode with our hint towards what's happening in April. But just to quickly go over it, in April, Lindsay and I are heading somewhere to a specific mm-hmm. place or places. And we have been dropping hints on our Patreon page. Uh, patrons, we are going to reach out to you soon about how to get a hold of you during our trip because we really want to share what we're doing with you. So we're going to have a poll coming soon. So keep an eye out for that. It may already be up mm-hmm. by the time this episode comes out, but we're really, really excited. We're going to share it with our Patreon first, and then we will also be talking about it in a later episode with what we're doing and our hints. We've kind of been sprinkling them throughout episodes. I do think it is important to note that we are not telling you every time we talk about a hint. We are simply sometimes just talking about a thing mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you're going to go, ah. Oh. Oh, later on and we're looking at each other with knowing eyes but you can't see our eyes this is a podcast don't be silly <laughs> but yeah we're really really stoked so again patrons will hear it first then we'll talk about it in a later podcast but big thank you to all our patrons and again if you want to join our patreon it starts at a dollar per month and goes up from there and all of you any amount can get into our discord and obviously our Patreon page where we're dropping the hints. So if you mm-hmm. want to look into our Patreon, it's on our website. There's a link there. I also, real quick, Amanda, are you cool with me saying the following? If you're not, just you'll just take it out when we're editing. But we are going on a spooky vacation, going to several spooky destinations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We are, yeah. As much as we can, we are going to be trying to interact with our Patreons while still like enjoying ourselves, right? Yes, yes. We're going to be sharing the deets and the hot goss from inside the house yeah the call is coming from within the house exactly exactly we will show you (laughs) yes i do want to point out that so long as we have service which we cannot guarantee because it's not a technologically robust place but so long as we have the capability there can be like oh hey what if you did xyz and to me i'm like oh that's exciting versus like oh here's just a picture of where we are because sometimes it will be just a picture but as much as we can be like oh like do you want us to do these things right you can do a little bit of vicarious living through our spooky travels exactly and as long as it's respectful too oh yeah yeah, yeah. always respectful although i think all of our patrons are very respectful but just put it out there (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, a treasure, a delight. But anyways, yes. So we're really, really stoked. And special thank you to everyone that's been a patron for a while. Some of our new ones, too. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. It really makes us so happy when someone joins. And then, like, our discussions are great. We just love you. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you've listened to all of our episodes so far, this are just kisses for you, generally, as well. Because we're almost, this year, that we will get to our 200th episode, mm-hmm. which is wild to me. Yeah. And who would have thought that this was the episode that got us famous? <laughs> Every once in a while, I just cling on to a joke. We brought Malvern, Iowa 
back to the map, and now we're bringing the Basilosaurus back to existence. Mm-hmm. Look at us go. <laughs> Look at us go. <laughs> you can hear my stomach rumbling now, too. Great, great. <laughs> the sounds of true creeps. <laughs> And lastly, uh, if you do want to support the show and you haven't already left us a review, head to iTunes. Even if you don't have an iPhone, you can make an iTunes account. If you leave us a review, we'd be happy to send you a sticker. Just send us an email or go to our website and give us the um, screenshot and we'd be happy to send you a sticker. Yeah. So many fun things. So many things. So much happening. But with that, have a great weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. (laughs) I mean, a horror in itself was they told me today when I went for my follow up that they had to drill real deep into my jaw. So that's just never a thing you want to hear. No, you don't. Especially while you're like alive. You're like, what'd you do? Well, <laughs> you especially don't want to hear that while you're alive. If I was alive. a ghost, I'd be like, okay, that's fine. But like, yeah, I was alive when you did that to my jaw. Yeah, no, that's, again, very fair. Very fair. Tea stuff. It's it's not fucking fun. It's not. No. 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 I wanted to just be in like a coma for the last week. I feel like that would be better. Just put me in a coma. I mean, I would imagine that all four wisdom teeth at one time is not fun in and of itself. And then, as you learned, being over the age of 35 makes it scarier, which didn't even occur to me that like... Neither did I. No, I was like... 35 is where your mouth becomes geriatric. Like, it's a low bar. It was, yeah. I was like, I'm not 95. And then when they're like, it takes quite a bit longer to heal when you're over 30, especially over 35. And I was like, but I'm like 20. What do you mean? mentally i am not here in this place in either in time and space and age exactly exactly they they did not give a fuck they were just like "Uh, okay weirdo we're gonna fuck up your mouth good luck (laughs) they didn't fuck up your mouth they made it fucking painful but they tried to make it so things didn't get worse correct i mean They weren't bothering me. It was just like, you should get these out. I should have just said, when I die, you can take them. Would have been easier. Look, as a person who did not get any wisdom teeth removed, but I did have one that cracked, impacted, and got infected, I wish I would have, like, gotten it out before then. Because it was like, in addition to the healing that had to happen afterwards... I had months of pain because I was like, this is going to be expensive. And I didn't have insurance at the time. And I didn't have money to spend like thousands of dollars in a dental procedure because that's what I told myself it was going to be. And then it was $152. And I was so upset (laughs) that I didn't have to be in that much pain for that long, which like not that that's no money. But when you're thinking it's a four digit number, I was just like, "Mm -hmm, okay, okay. Well, when you're in pain too. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's fair. It's all bad. Two stuff sucks. No matter whether you're preemptive or not, it sucks. Yeah, my right side is still just, like, big. It's awful. But I did today listen to an NPR little snippet about vocal exercises. So maybe I'll sound amazing. (laughs) For once. Show me up. For once. No, Amanda (laughs) always sounds amazing. I was like, how do I not sound like I'm just mumbling over? I don't even know what that sound was. It sounded like a dog coughing, but it came from in front of me. So I can't tell you. (laughs) Who could know? Who could know? My chubby little fingers keep hitting all the wrong letters. (laughs) I don't trust that. That was a robot. And that's Tulpa, not Topla. I like Topla. Me too. If we all... Oh my God. Just consider thinking about the Basilosaurus. You are completely right. You're exiled. I am exiled. (laughs) Toodaloo.